Tyler knows everything. All right. Hello, friends. Well, we're back with another episode of the Tyler Knows Everything podcast where the nose is crossed out because I always want to learn more. And, you know, some, something that I've always been fascinated with is the military because me as an outsider, I'm just looking in. I'm like the people that are watching the movies and reading the books or for me, audiobooks probably or listening to podcasts. Uh, but it's this particular generation of the military that you really don't hear much about because, you know, they have all these documentaries on World War II and I grew up in the, you know, the Gulf War and the Afghan War, but that Vietnam era you know, you, you really don't hear a whole lot about it. And that seems to be the generation that, you know, you see Vietnam vets that are homeless and people have forgotten about them and they're not taken care of. And people call it the, you know, the war that we lost and all these things. So I'm really excited today to learn more about that particular generation. So we're here with uh, David and Sarah, another <laughs> husband and wife Stacey. duo. Stacy. Stacy. Okay. <laughs> what is it, Sarah? That, that was my ex-wife. I, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I literally just wrote it down. So. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, how you got started with this book and and, the, and more specifically the correct pronunciation of that battle. Zongbo. Okay. Zongbo is the name of it. And yeah, and again, that's that's one that I've never heard about. In, yeah, in yeah. Books. Well, that's why I wrote about it because I felt, uh, in fact, uh, the person who did my foreword mentioned it too that uh, we had had uh, three big battles uh, that particular year with this unit that I was with, the second twenty eighth in the first 16th, which were the two uh, big battalions that I was supporting. And the other ones uh, had books written about them, but this and, and they actually had less casualties in this particular battle, mm -hmm. but, um, but they had more important people in them. <laughs> and they had a general that was involved in one of them who uh, his son got killed in it, so uh, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had less important people in, in our particular battle, but we had... Uh, 187 men uh, as casualties in a, roughly about a two and a half, three hour period, uh, with 37 of them dead, 150 of them terribly wounded. And um, and so, basically, I mean, that prompted me. I wanted to immortalize these men who are actually the men who died are written here in the in the. Yeah, so show that. So you've got the the year 1967. Right. And, and you've got all the men's name formed into the yeah, numbers. Yeah, minus okay. two of them. There's two men. Well, there's 39 men who actually got killed, but two of the men weren't. So there's 189, really. Mm -hmm. But two of the men were really shooting uh, uh, artillery for us in their 175, which is a huge cannon howitzer, right. uh, uh, blew up when they were shooting for us. So they were firing so fast that uh, it overheated, and they opened up, put another round in, and boom. And they were dead. Wow. So, and there was actually six more men uh, wounded when that uh, 175 blew up. Um, and so, I do include them in the story, but I, but they weren't really on the ground with us fighting. These men were actually on the ground fighting with us. Mm -hmm. So, um, but but um, I know Veterans Day. I, th I think you're doing this for Veterans Day. So yeah. So tomorrow will be Veterans Day, and I'm going to release a special episode, you know, just for right. for you on it. I've, I've had several uh, veterans on the on the show in the past as well, and uh, usually release episodes every Saturday. So I'm going to do a special edition tomorrow on Monday. Oh, uh, great, great. Well, and and I, and I think that you know, a lot of people really don't realize how many um, men. Uh, have have you know died in these uh, various wars, right? Um, including ones that you mentioned before the first and second world war. I mean, one hundred and ten roughly in the first, four hundred thousand, one hundred and ten thousand. Excuse me, four hundred and five thousand, something like that in the second world war. Yeah, and there's yeah. not very many living World War II uh, veterans at this time. Yeah, so a lot yeah. of them have passed on because they're, they're in their eighties and nineties. Yeah, but, but when we find some. You know, they're almost treated like royalty right, around here. Right. But you don't yeah. you don't see that with, with this era. Right. And and, and then and, and it's also interesting too, well the Korean War too was mm -hmm. a huge, nasty, quick war, but mm -hmm. so many men died. Fifty four thousand men died, not necessarily all from combat, but from freezing to death from whatever. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it was only like thirty eight thousand from uh, only uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, were actually 
killed in combat and the rest died of accidents, disease, or whatever, freezing uh, during the battles, uh, that kind of a thing. And, and, um, and when, when they talk about also how much time people spent, like they, they see the Second World War, you know, as a terrible war, but actually we spent more combat time in battle mm -hmm. than they did in the Second World War. Right. Uh, we, we, it's not the years. I'm talking about the amount of time that the men actually, who were uh, infantry, sure. actually were out in the jungle fighting instead of sitting around somewhere being told, okay, tomorrow or next day or the day after, whenever we're going to move by vehicles to a new location. Well, we, of course, didn't work that way. We actually choppered in or walked into places, and uh, sometimes we did convoys, but not very often. Mm -hmm. But we were constantly... Um, the men who were actually in combat, you know, who were, again, like infantry people, um, were doing a, almost every single day doing mm -hmm. something. And so 1967, what was going on in the world back then? Well, in 1967, this particular day, uh, well, one thing, there was all kinds of race riots that, that year. It was some of the worst race riots we ever had in Detroit, burning down most of Detroit, mm -hmm. um, uh, Baltimore, um, some other places. But... That particular day, I, I, I juxtaposed my story of what happened with us uh, against this Monterey Rock Festival that was going on, Pop Festival, uh, which was the first major rock festival in the United States. It was a three-day thing with Janis Joplin there, mm -hmm. actually from our yeah, area. Yeah, from Port Arthur. Yeah, yeah. So she was a uh, she was there the uh, first day. Um, she was a you know they, she blew them away. I, no, excuse me, she wasn't there the first day. She was there the second day, but she blew them away. They really really loved her. Um, and uh, I think that was the first time she had been in such a huge concert because there was a couple, of, I think, 100,000 or 150,000 people there, you know, at this particular rock concert. Um, and, and I wanted to compare it because had I been back in the States, I probably would have been in, in a civilian. I probably would have been there. Uh, so I wanted to just show that, you know, these were my contemporaries, and um, this is what my side uh, more you know people of my age were doing back in the states while we were actually over in this particular war right that we really had no choice in either by the way because we couldn't vote either yeah so what was the reason we were in or what, what was the reason we got involved in vietnam in well the, first place? the reason we got involved in vietnam really um in in the beginning going all the way back to the end of the second world war um we had promised, I hate to say this, but we had promised Ho Chi Minh, who was the uh, leader of, of Vietnam at that time, um, that we, if we won the war and he fought on our side, which he did, uh, and um, that they could decide who they wanted to, how they wanted to be governed. And uh, that was Roosevelt who promised him that. But when Truman came in, Truman sort of said, ah, yeah, the heck with that. Mm -hmm. We're... We're not going to live up to that. We're going to give it back to the French. And the French had, of course, re remember, the French had been defeated by Germany, so the French didn't have much of an army. And a lot of them had fought, actually, against us during the Second World War because they were forced to, not that <clears throat> they made a, a choice. They either, you know, get shot in the back or they shoot us, one of the two. <laughs> so they decided to, you know, a lot of them fight for the Germans. Okay, so anyway, so when the Vietnam uh, when we ended the Second World War, um, Truman decided to give it back to the back to France, and France wasn't prepared for it. So, um, um, China, uh, India, um, United States, and England all went in as and, and had different areas of uh, Vietnam to control uh, to try to get it prepared to turn back over to the French, and then that course did happen a year later and then the French lost the war too they couldn't keep control of it and then um, Eisenhower who right before Kennedy he didn't want to lose any blood there he promised there would be no American blood uh, lost in uh, Vietnam but Kennedy made a decision to send troops in there so he sent about 17,000 men into Vietnam and, and during that period of time the casualty percentage was greater. I mean, you had more of a chance of getting killed than you did later, actually, just because there's so few of us there. And I wasn't there at that time. I wasn't there until 67. 
But then when Kennedy was killed and Lyndon B. Johnson came in, and he actually uh, immediately increased the number of men over there to half a million, roughly. When I was there, it was a roughly half a million men, which to me was great. I mean, as far as being feeling like you have enough men there to help you out and, uh, if you need the help, that was much better than saying, gee, you know, this whole country, uh, we had only 17,000 men here. And, and when you say that, they're not all fighters. They're, most of them are admin-type people. Support staff. Support yeah. staff, yeah. I mean, you got to the medics, the cooks, all these different people that are there who are not supposed to be, you know, people yeah. who are in combat. I think I heard that modern day only about 15% are actual fighters. Yeah, which is... And it, it takes yeah. so much more just to get them there right. and logistics purposes. And yeah, and, and even at that time, uh, like I was an artillery officer, so it was just one of me with this company, uh, Alpha Company, 2nd 28th, um, and I was the man who would be the person who would deliver the artillery, delivering the fire. Uh, with, and I, I was, you know, just like a grunt. I, I was like an infantry man. I, every place they went, I went. I slept on the ground when they slept on the ground. Um, Back then, was it still mortar fire? No, no, or? we used 105s. Okay. Oh, no, we, we, there was mortars, absolutely. But, yeah. but um, the mortars were the infantry men. They, they had the mortars, and we had, that's why they wanted us to, because we had the bigger guns we oh, had the 105s yeah. 155s the 175s the eight inch guns yeah is that like towed artillery uh, well or? it could have been but we actually you know used um, um chinooks to lift them up and oh, some, some okay. of them were towed mm -hmm. but most of them were lifted up by chinooks and dropped into clearings and then we quickly calibrated them and decided which way was where we we're supposed to be shooting and and got going yeah. um, but um so that was much different than what our training was because when we were trained in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, we'd be up on top of a big old hill and you see a bunch of cars down below you and you're supposed to blow the car up in a couple rounds. Yeah, and Oklahoma's flat. Yeah, right? it's flat. Yeah, exactly. There's no and, uh, distorted visibility. Right, and there, everything you did was by ear. So when you're, well, not everything. I suppose some people were lucky enough to be able to see what they were shooting at. But when I was there, everything I did was by ear. So... I'd have to try to figure out where are my rounds landing, you know, in front of me. Um, how far away are they really? And during this particular battle, we shot over 8,000 artillery rounds during this period of time, and, which is a lot of rounds for a battle. But but uh, did the uh, did the enemy know the jungle better than you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. this this is their backyard. In this particular battle, they were already prepared for us, and they knew we were coming there. They had already seen choppers flying around the place for a couple of days. They had seen the uh, um, engineers going to cut a couple of trees down. So I mean, it was like, oh, broadcasting. Oh, Americans are coming. Let's get set up. We're going to knock the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. Excuse my language. Very good. Okay. <laughs> but you, know, you have to clear that one, okay? Oh, podcasts are good. That's what's great about them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, um, so they knew we were coming. In fact, later, um, and this is not my book, but a second book about another battle, they actually talked to the uh, the colonel, their their commander of this 271st Regiment, which was the unit that was fighting against us. And by the way, the the battles in the in the 67 and 68, and maybe even further on, I'm not sure, but were big battles. They weren't like people think of them. They talk about the guerrilla warfare. Well, guerrilla warfare to a certain extent was there, but the big battles were there too. This was units that had 2,000 men in it against us. Right. Because what do they mean by guerrilla? That's people that aren't in an organized army. Well, they're in an organized group, but they're they're hitting. You know, they're they're just small um, attacks on you, and, mm. and, and you know they're kind of comparable to what we would think of nowadays as an insurgent, I guess. Well, from yeah, the Middle East. The, the, we call them insurgents. Of course, yeah. that was their country. Okay. Oh right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were the <laughs> we insurgents. Were the insurgents. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> but. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the guerrilla warfare was basically, you know, you're sneaking around in the woods and you're shooting people and then you, you do a lot of destruction, blowing up stuff, and then you you fade away into the jungle. Mm -hmm. But And that was like the people that were in villages and stuff who were sometimes forced into it because if they didn't do it, their families would suffer from the Viet Cong or they did it because um, they hated us. And even though they appeared to like us I mean, like the person who actually took care of my hooch back in the base camp 
I thought was, you know, my best buddy in a way because he cleaned my clothes, he polished my boots, even though we were out in the jungle. And he's always talking to me, you know. Uh, then I find out at Tet Offensive, um, he's found on the outside of our camp, dead, being shot because he was actually a, a VC who was, uh, you know, living in this particular village that we thought he was, you know, safe and secure and that he could come and work for us. Oh, okay. But he w- so he got retaliated against. No, or, or- he he was he was a VC, an actual VC, you know, Viet Cong. He was covert? Yeah, very covert. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So he was coming into our hooch because we hired him to, mm. you know, come in and clean up our place and get our clothes cleaned because they don't have cleaners over there. Right, yeah. <laughs> so we have to hire some locals or do it ourselves or, uh, you know, or stink. I was curious about the difference in technology of that war versus modern warfare because now we have GPS. Yeah, we didn't have place. GPS. We had yeah. a stupid map that actually was outdated. In fact, in this particular battle, one of the things, I don't know if my wife told you, I want to do a play based on this battle okay. uh, starting next year. Um, so one of the things, I, I, you know, in my play, I was trying to figure out how to do, how to present some of these um, issues that we had there. Well, one of them was, in fact, that this village that was called Zongbo mm-hmm. didn't even exist anymore. It had been blown up. It was It was decimated. And the trees had all grown back, and so maybe two years prior, um, because the, the area we were in was really owned by the Viet Cong. They they controlled that. They had the two seventy first, two seventy second, two seventy third regiments. That's like six thousand BC living in this this jungle area. Um, but they had clearings. Okay, so anyway, so this particular village, Songbo, we blew it away maybe a year or two ago, and uh, prior to this battle, and then. So all we had on the map was this name called Zongbo that was supposed to be a village, but if you got there, there was nothing there. So when you're trying to find stuff out there in the jungle, based on these stupid maps that we had, uh, it was very difficult. And a lot of times um, the way we did it by shooting artillery um, in where the rounds landed, where the they, they, we would you know, have an idea. They would tell us where the... where. We would we would be in, in, in the jungle, so we could actually direct where we thought we wanted the rounds to land. We'd start them off like a, a thousand meters away, which mm-hmm. is you know a, a one kilometer. Right. Um, we'd start them out there, and we'd hear it land, and then they they would be able to see on the map where that's supposed to be actually landing at that particular time. And then we'd start bringing it in, and that would give us an idea of really where we were. Now sometimes we had a spotter above us, so he could sort of uh, see where the round landed and give us a quicker idea of where in the hell we were wow but, that's astonishing that that was like standard protocol it wasn't to, standard protocol uh, oh, but okay. it was well, the you know, cowboy way of figuring it, it out. was the yeah. way we had to figure it out sometimes it, in fact in this particular battle luckily we got lost um the, and when we when i say we got lost there's like a hundred of us that are in a big long line going through the jungle and the point man is the poor he's got a lot to worry about first thing he's the guy in the front who's going to get killed first <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> anyway, anyways, he's the guy that's going to get uh, killed first. And and the second thing is that he's got all this pressure on him about, um, you know, um, where we're going and how we, you know that he's he's the the lead man, mm-hmm. and he's not uh, an officer. He's unfortunately an enlisted man, probably of a lower rank, and. Not, I don't want to say disposable, but you know, he, luck, a lot of times, you know, the guy who is indicated to you're going to be the point man today, you know, some poor slob who just got in a week or two ago, and oh my God, you know. Were most of the men uh, that you were fighting with, did they sign up or did they get oh, I'd drafted? Say, I'd say half and half. I mean, and then of course, like in my own situation, I actually um, was. Um, I got my little letter in the mail saying you have to go in the, in the service and you got to report in at this particular time. But prior to me reporting, I actually joined. Okay. So during this 30-day period they gave me to 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 come in. And what I, was your age then? I was 21. 21. Mm-hmm. And I was supposed to be going to college, but mm-hmm. I decided playing guitar was more important at that time. Oh, okay. So, and, 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 they, and they didn't consider that very important. Was that probably the last major war where we had draft? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And there was a lot of protest about the draft going on then. Well, tons of protests because, number one, we could not vote uh, until you're 21. But you could, Oh, okay. So the voting so age was... Voting 21. age was 21. Mm-hmm. You could kill at 18, and you could get blown away at 18. Right. And, and the Army would give you cigarettes, and they would also give you beer for free while you're in Vietnam when you're 18. Or even 17, mm-hmm. you know, it didn't make any difference. But you cannot vote. So you had no say, you know, really. So, yeah, there was a lot of protests. Wow. Um, I mean, huge protests. I mean, monster protests. And, um, and I, you know, I think th- it was very important, the protests. I mean, I disliked that to a certain degree that some of them disliked us, um, the soldiers, mm-hmm. you know, the military people. Um, but, again, we had... Very few choices. We either go to prison, we go to Canada, or we go in the service. You know. Oh wow. You know. So you don't. Yeah. I mean, even Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. You know, right during this period of time, in fact, he had just uh, decided he was not going to go in, and so they were having a big um, court case in Houston at that particular time on what they were going to do with him. Put him in prison, not put him in prison. You know. So it was a, it was a major deal. But, um, was he already a big name at that point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it interfered in his career big time. Oh, yeah. So, um, but, that, but uh, yeah, I think half of the people maybe were, I mean, some guys, okay, they, they, they couldn't find a job. They dropped out of school. A lot of people would, would drop out of school back. I, I mean, maybe even this nowadays, too. But I know my own class that I was uh, – my hometown class, which I actually was an army brat, so I moved around a lot. But my hometown class, when I was like a uh, freshman there, we had like 60 kids there. By the time I was a senior, there was only like about 28, 29. All those people had disappeared. I guess I'm going to be a farmer. I guess I'm going to do this. I guess I'm going to do that. Oh, wow. So they just dropped out. And some of them may have joined the army, um, you know, when they were a junior in high school or something. I don't know. But they – so – um, so a lot of these people didn't really have a great education, so they joined the army because the army would take them at that particular time, gotcha. or the Marines or whoever they wanted to be. And and and, I, and again, even today, I, I don't think people, young people, really understand what this stuff is really about. They no. don't. Um, you know, we especially have these you know these video games that people play, and oh man, I got killed. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you're not really killed, and you didn't have any fear of dying. You right. didn't. You didn't see people that you you know that you really cared for mm-hmm. uh, get killed. Um, so you know, I think I think that, and I, even at that particular time, I, you know, men thought, "Oh my God, I'm going to be a soldier," and blah blah blah. And, and up until this particular battle, even for myself, I, I really didn't see it as all that terribly bad. Our life out there, you know, it was crappy living in the jungle. Mosquitoes all over you, leeches and things of this nature, soaked all the time, your feet rotting away, um, you know, crotch rotch. Was it constant <laughs> rain? Yeah, yeah, not constant rain, but rain almost every single day. Yeah, oh, okay. and so you're always wet. Or, and we were in a jungle um, or in a swamp much of this time. So uh, we'd go out for, you know, a couple of weeks at a time, and you're wet all the time, and you don't, in your, my, I was lucky. I really didn't have a lot of these issues. Some of the men did, but some of the men's feet, you know, were rotting away because they're so soaked. Yeah, I remember hearing in Forrest Gump where he tells them that they always need clean socks. Yeah, well, it's stupid because the minute you put the clean socks on and you put your boots back on, you're soaked again. So it yeah. Was, so half the time, men didn't want to take their boots off because they were afraid when they took their their socks off that uh, they would be pulling skin off too, and you oh, sort man. of. You know, didn't want. <laughs> did the, me, you didn't did, want that to happen. Did the drafted mm-hmm. men go immediately to boot camp? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, not immediately. I mean, you had you had like a thirty day period, I think, for uh-huh. reporting in. Okay. You had a particular date, and then you yeah you went to boot camp, and um, and had uh, two months there, and then advanced infantry training or whatever, and then. A lot of them went straight to Vietnam. So, I mean, a lot of the guys that were in my story here, they had joined the Army or had entered the Army just, uh, you know, just a few months prior. And and now they're in this huge battle that they never uh, thought they'd ever see. 
and w what was the reason that we were using Agent Orange? Was it to huh. defoliate? To yeah, to defoliate, exactly. And, and where I was, that's what we used a lot. And, and not only did we use it there, but people like myself and many other men, uh, when we went around for water, we had canteens full of water, mm -hmm. right? So if we had a stream and we're out of water, well, we didn't have a fountain to go to or water truck or a faucet, <laughs> you know? We just scoop up some water in our canteen. We put these stupid pills in there, swash it around, and drink it. Yeah, yeah it's good. But Agent Orange was in that water too, wow. and, and of course, on all the trees around us, uh, dripping on us, or yeah. or you get into a place where it's just nothing but dead trees, and it looks like you're in some sort of alien planet, yeah, uh, where it's nothing there but you know smashed down, rotting trees, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but Agent Orange is, I think, a terrible thing that you know that we used. Um, and it ended up being really bad for so many of our men. Yeah, for health problems later on. Yeah. Did, have we gotten any better about providing resources for retired veterans these days? Uh, well, I think we have, but but again, uh, I don't know if I should. You know, I, I felt like things have got better right now in the last couple of years, to tell you the truth. Uh, I had had a situation uh, I don't know, about eight years ago, whatever, where... I had stopped using the VA. Uh, well, I hadn't used them hardly at all, really, in all my life. But a um, few, you know, I think in the early 80s, I had used them for some surgery. And it was no major problem then. But then later, uh, and we had these stupid little VA cards that just had appointments on it, no picture, no nothing. So I just would have to go in and, you know, they'd put another appointment date on my appointment card. Mm -hmm. But then I uh, had to get a new card. They said, and so I went to VA here in Beaumont, and um, they said, "Oh, you got to fill out a financial," and which I did. And then three years later, and and during these three years, I can't do anything with them. But three years later, I get wow. a letter saying, "I'm sorry, but you don't uh, qualify for VA. You, you make too much money." I thought everybody did. No, yeah, no. I didn't know that. Yeah, and wow. and so you could apply for Obamacare, which actually had Blue Cross Blue Shield, so I didn't really need insurance. What I wanted yeah. was purely um, some of the benef other benefits that it provided. Right. And and uh, because I've heard that veterans that are retired who have a, another well, I'm not retired. Or, oh, right. Uh, but for um, let's say they have an additional insurance like Blue Cross Blue mm -hmm. Shield, if if they have the choice not to go to the VA, then they never go to the VA. They always use that secondary choice. It seems like because that. I guess maybe it's easier to use efficiency. I mean, I, yeah I've mm -hmm. talked to some places that I do uh, frequent for health care and they said they would use my VA if I like it but then I got to get approval for every little thing that has to happen mm -hmm. I mean they'll tell me you need this now we got to get approval to do this mm -hmm. and it may take another week or two whatever yeah. retired from the service I meant not retired in life I mean, you know <laughs> no I'm retired I'm uh, I never retired I actually um, got out after about 13 years so oh so it, it was less formal back then i guess no no or but you you would have to stay in 20 years to oh right really retire okay, got you yeah so so i don't get a hunk of money from the government the for pension a, yeah i guess yeah which was a dumb thing also mm. not to stay in a few more years oh yeah seven so, seven more years seven yeah. more years which goes really fast um but I think for me, yeah, they have been really good. I thought the VA clinic here was quite, you know, really nice. But then I go look at reviews and I find people think it sucks. But uh, yeah, I guess maybe some of the nonprofit organizations have tried to fill the gap for veteran services. I see a lot of those that have. Been well, well, and again, I don't know what people expect too. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I I have always, when I've been there, they have been on time. If I'm supposed to be there at three o'clock or. 11 in the morning whatever and i get there my appointment is you know 11 or 11:05. you know mm. but maybe for emergency things it's not so hot maybe if yeah. a person you know is uh, having a heart attack it's probably not the best place to go to yeah Better right. go so, to the hospital well, since you were allowed around a lot of heavy machinery did you did you experience any of that concussive trauma or hearing loss or um i might have a little bit of hearing loss but um I should have a lot because we did not use any earplugs when we're 
they, during oh, these battles. Wow, yeah. People didn't say, gee, there's a battle going on. Let me put the earplugs in because I don't want to hear the bombs yeah. or the artillery. I mean, we, we wear earplugs when we go to the gun range for handguns yeah, nowadays. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, we, no. And you're shooting cannons. Well, I'm I'm listening to them on the other end. I mean, yeah. they're five miles away. I'm right. I'm directing. I'm I'm on the ground, and I want it to hit, you know, in front of me somewhere. Was standard issue back then the M16? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and I had a M16 and I had a 45. Did it do good in the water like that? Or? Um, luckily, no. The men didn't like it at all. And some men use M14 because they didn't trust the M16. Okay. Um, I mean, first they felt so flimsy when you're it's so light and the m14 was so much heavier oh, okay you know, like you i guess the like, m16 was more polymer maybe yeah like yeah. the modern yeah modern. And, and and it it had many issues uh, i think the Viet Cong with their ak-47 was a, a far superior weapon that we were fighting up against that's and, one that can get mud and sand yeah and everything. you get mud and sand and can shoot more bullets too mm-hmm. you know yeah, they bigger, had big, bigger uh, magazine bigger yeah. magazines yeah and um and you know, that's, that was the other thing. You know, so many people thought, you know, we're fighting people with pitchforks and BB guns and slingshots. And they were well, well armed. They had their AK-47s. They had, you know, uh, grenades. They had machine guns. They had, you know, everything that we had as far as soldiers. Mm-hmm. And they had Claymore mines or oh, equivalent wow. to Claymore mines. Um, they'd make them themselves and they would steal ours. Uh, oh, okay. You know, um, and... And they would, of course, be getting them from China and from Russia too. Um, so. Oh, okay. So they had support from oh, God, some pretty yeah. S- yeah. big superpowers. Yeah. And of course, at the end of the war, the true end of the war, when they took over Saigon, I mean, you see them, and there were tanks and everything else. I mean, mm-hmm. so and they had, they actually had tanks uh, during our, not during this battle, but they had tanks during, they used tanks uh, up north on some battles, mm-hmm. and then they decided, well. They're, they're blowing us up with aircraft, so maybe we oh, okay. don't want to waste our tanks. If you had to pick some piece of artillery or the helicopter, maybe, or what would be the MVP of that war for us that we just had really helped well, us out? The, 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 the chopper, you know, yeah. the helicopters were unbelievable, you know. I, I, they were sort of scary to be flying around in a helicopter where the bottom of it uh, could easily... Um, they, they 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 did not stop a bullet. Oh. So you know, yeah. they could either come in right through the where the door was supposed to be, which mm-hmm. there was no door, right. or come right through the bottom. So you lot like I would sit there with my uh, flak jacket underneath me, even though the flak jacket really wouldn't stop a bullet, but it might slow it down a little bit. So yeah. it only went maybe a couple inches into my butt, right, <laughs> so all the way up into my chest or something. So yeah, but uh, did you ever watch the show Mash? Yes. It, was it pretty accurate as far well, as... Well, MASH is about Korean War. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I know... How, how far apart was that? In the, only a few years. Okay, before? Or? The Korean, Korean War was before, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 um, I, and I, you know, it sort of made... Uh, the Korean War is a horrible war, so, you know, I, I don't know if uh, the men who had been in the Korean War really loved the, the the way they were portrayed in mash because oh, it yeah. was sort of a jovial yeah it was a comedy thing and yeah. you know uh and i think to me uh, i i'm glad i was in if i had to be in one of those two wars i preferred the vietnam war to the mm-hmm. korean war because the korean war didn't last very long but you got fifty four thousand men killed in a couple of years right in 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 freezing environment I mean, yeah i didn't realize it was so deadly yeah, it was very as deadly. As far as yeah, numbers. just yeah. yeah. I mean, not all of them, like I said, were killed from combat, but a lot of men ended up, you know, being frozen to death. Yeah, that's how a lot of wars are lost. Yeah, uh, you know, especially countries dysentery that, things yeah. of this nature. Countries um, that attack Russia in the winter, you know, in the past and things like that. It's mostly them not being able to survive Siberia. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and, and the and the thing about um, the Korean War too, you know, you if you read stories about it, you they talk about. Well, after that, you know, people were saying, well, your gun's your best friend, and, you know, you could sleep with your gun and everything. Well, then you had to sleep with your gun to keep it warm enough so that you could use it, because if not, it was the M14 or M1, I think, at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, the grease and stuff in it was, you know, would harden up, and you couldn't oh, shoot it. Yeah. You know, so it was worthless. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, you, you know, 
Um, were flamethrowers used much? Yeah, yeah. Flamethrowers were used in, in our war, too. And I think now, aren't they kind of outlawed through the Geneva? I have Commission? no idea. Yeah, because you don't really see them much anymore. Yeah, I mean, um, the flamethrowers, yeah, we used them when uh, Viet Cong were down in tunnels. Uh, they would use a flamethrower, to, which was a terrible way to go. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then we used napalm, and, and we had these food gas bombs, too, that they actually around uh, our encampments we would put these huge barrels of food gas which was this petroleum uh, jelly that uh, would be explosives around the barrel too and when you ex- <coughs> excuse me when you exploded it this stuff went everywhere mm-hmm. so we try to have them all around like when I after this battle I, I got promoted to a fire direction officer which was a much safer job than a forward observer and so the camp the the base camp where i was at then shooting from that's where the guns really were um and we we were out in the jungle too but we weren't living like animals we were actually you know yeah and so the enemy would use that tunnel network yes to move around yeah yeah the tunnels were huge i mean in in the length of them Mm -hmm. and how many there were um in fact if you go over there now they actually have tours in the tunnels oh they're that big yeah they're that big yeah, especially in the area that I was in, this this area that I was in, the, the called the Iron Triangle, they had them all over the place. And you might have seen books called, you know, the Tunnels of Coochie, um, but they were everywhere. And they tried to blow them up with B-52 strikes. They were supposed to, you know, crush them. Oh, yeah. Um, but they either weren't correct on that because, or they dug them back very quickly, whatever. Mm. But uh, they had their hospitals down there. Oh, they wow. had um it's like an underground city yeah it was like <laughs> an underground city yeah goodness and and, uh, and so you didn't know they existed if you're flying above them of course you never know that they were there just like where we were this battle was taking place mm-hmm. that whole place you you know they were seeing us we we fly in the first time we flew into this camp w- which was called lz roof and um and we were about 600 men you know flying in the choppers mm-hmm. and into a swamp and then after that, um, and, and we had a little bit of contact. We had actually like 22 men um, wounded and another um, seven men killed by the time this battle started. Um, and that was over like a three-day period. So it was not nice, but it wasn't terrible. But what they were doing at that time was hitting us every single day, daytime, nighttime, with mortar rounds or rockets which was very unnerving because, you know, no matter w- w- what you were doing or what time of day it was, all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. And, and, and like I said, people were getting killed from those noises. Yeah. Um, and you just didn't know, and, and there's no way to know where it was going to land. So, you know, someplace in that mess, someone's probably going to get hurt, and you just hope it's not you. Did you have to go several days at a time with no sleep? Just because... Yeah, I mean, this the, the this area we were in was so nasty. For me, I was an art- like I said, I was an artillery officer, so um, anytime we got mortar rounds coming in, nighttime, daytime, whenever, mm-hmm. I had to try to return fire to where we thought they came from. Of course, that was just a guess, yeah. because by the time they shoot them, you hear them popping, because they're close by, so you, you hear them... And you know they're going up in the air, and they're going to come some down on you somewhere. By the time I actually um, try to calculate where they came from and start firing back there, those guys probably half a click, a, half a you know kilometer away. So, yeah. but but um, so that meant I had to get up immediately. And of course, you want to get up immediately too for those yeah. kinds of things and try to figure out you know where most of them are going to be landing and try to get uh, somewhere further away from those particular ones. But, uh, and there's no way, you know, really, when a mortar round comes in, you can say, well, I'll hide under a tree. Well, that's no good because if it hits up in the tree, the stuff rains down on top of you. There's yeah. no place to go on other than underground. And wow. we couldn't go underground there because it was so wet. Mm. You couldn't dig a hole yeah. because if you dug a hole, it's full of water. Right. So. What were the base camps like? Well, some of the base camps were really nice. Um, I mean, Lock Hay, actually, when I was there, you're talking about my our American base camp? Sometimes in movies, you know, you see the tents just pup tents almost out in the jungle yeah um maybe that's when they're th- that's control. not a base camp okay th- th- i mean that could be a base camp for some i suppose i won't mm-hmm. 
But our base camp for the first infantry division was in Lock A, and um, it, it was you know we it started off with tents, but by the time I got there, um, most of the places were these nasty looking hooches that were part wood, part um, uh, screening, oh, yeah. um, open screening, and then they had little flap down doors that would flap over the window supposedly to I guess block. Uh, if you could drop them down quick. You so could. was the hooch like a hut? Yeah, yeah. it was like a hut. And, mm-hmm. and and for the officers, we'd have, I think we had four guys in a hooch. So you had quite a bit of space for each one of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were, they were they were a good size, actually. But no, no bathroom, no running water. You had to get up and go out to the nasty place to use as a... Oh, just go out in, yeah. the, in the in the Well, no, it's not in the woods. They oh. actually have these nasty places that... Uh, like an outhouse? Like an outhouse, exactly. And, and, um, wow. and, and you know, terribly smelly place. Oh, yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Because it's not going anywhere. It's just in a, in yeah, a hole, I guess. It's, it's, well, it was in a big... They put them in 55-gallon drums, so you're crapping in a big 55-gallon drum. <laughs> <laughs> And were there many women at this point in the well, military? Well, there were there Vietnamese women. And oh, okay. uh, Lock Hay was actually, the, our place, our camp was s- surrounded a village. So it's sort of weird, but it did. It's, our, the village was inside of our camp. And that's why this guy was supposed to be friendly that was working for us because we were constantly using people from the village. We were protecting them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and um, And so he was from the village, and he was supposed to, you know, be a good guy and and cut my hair and things of this nature you know give me some money and he would tell me about you know the conversation like you know you 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 back now yeah i'm back you you go feel more um yeah maybe we're gonna go somewhere soon where you go oh Oh, we're gonna go up north oh bad place you know many 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 Viet Cong up there where you go up north you know Mm mm-hmm Oh, very, very bad. Luck in. No, 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 no gold there. But hell, at the same time, you know. He was gathering info. He was gathering info. Yeah, and I was yeah. stupid enough to tell him some. Right. You know? it, was it common that they knew English or just a few? I think a lot of them, of that, they were very intelligent, you know, many of them. I mean, yeah, you had these very, um, you had these villages where the people were, of course, totally uneducated, but then. People like him, I don't know if he's truly even from Lake or if he was, you know, from North Vietnam, well educated, and mm-hmm. uh, because they were much better educated there than we were, or, or than, excuse me, than the, the many of the Vietnamese down below. Mm-hmm. I mean, you sort of had this like Saigon and 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 Way and some of these places that were cities that actually had people well educated with they had universities and things. And then all of a sudden you go out in the jungle, and you had these towns um, that had people who didn't have a toilet, didn't even know what a toilet was, would be squatting on the side of the road, um, in front of you, no shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just very different. And, and and that's the problem, I think, too, that we had there, that we couldn't understand that culture. And and like Westmoreland, he, you know, had this whole policy of going out there and killing anybody who, you know, wanting us to kill anybody who he thought uh, that w- that we were considering probably on the side of the Viet Cong, so we either kill them or we take them and move them, burn their village down, and move them to a, to these tent cities around um, Saigon, mm-hmm. where they'd be safe. Mm-hmm. But when you burn burn down a village, um, you destroy the village. I mean, even though it looked like nothing to us, but a bunch of grass shacks, and some of the shacks were actually built out of beer cans. They they take the beer can, flatten it. So you had a Budweiser uh, house or Schlitz house or whatever. Made out of trash. Made out yeah. of trash, wow. yeah. But they look cool. You know, yeah. I used to think, wow, that's really, you know, mm-hmm. the whole roof. I, I think they were proud of them, too, you know. like Yeah, it's innovative. I, yeah. I got a Budweiser roof. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us how this all ends. Uh, that, well, it ends bad. Um, yeah. we, we, I think for both, of, for us and for the Viet Cong, I think it wasn't, not necessarily a win for either of us, although, of course, we, the Americans did say in the papers, um, you know, that we won. But nonetheless, we had, I think the men who died don't think we won. And I think right. uh, a lot of the men who got wounded, who, who you would remember this battle for the rest of their life because of those wounds, um, wouldn't, 
<coughs> excuse me, would not consider it a win either. Um, right. But also the Viet Cong, I think, um, you know, they they had a rough time too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the papers claim, which are totally stupid, 220 dead on their side. But again, where they even come, and those numbers are just made up numbers. Oh, okay. Because they would ask us, how many you think you killed? And um, I don't know. You couldn't really 20. see them. I mean, yeah. you can't see them. Yeah. And not only that, when I talked to some of the men who did supposedly go out to count them, they said, oh, no, 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 no. no. We're not going to lift up a bunch of trees and bushes yeah, exactly. And things to try to find bodies. We're going to go out there. And, and my sergeant, he, all he was, and, and I'm just paraphrasing what mm-hmm. this guy said. He said, my sergeant just told me, he says, okay, man, this is what we got. We got, we found 25 bodies, right? You understand? 25 bodies. Mm-hmm. Uh, sit down, take a smoke and everything. Make sure 25 bodies. You got that? Uh, okay, we're going to sit here for 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to go back. Yeah, get everybody's story to straight. Yeah. yeah. And so mm-hmm. go back and report, you know, this. And they don't want to be lifting. You lift up a tree and there's a uh, grenade tied to it and you blow yourself up or yeah. you roll a body over and someone stuck a grenade underneath that with the, mm. you know, and that will blow you up. So, yeah. or it's just a mess. And, and right, then, right. and if you see what happens after these, like I said, 8,000 rounds of artillery landing in an area, uh, you might have a leg here, a leg there. And are those belong to the same body or, <laughs> or yeah. are they two different people? Wow. You know? Yeah. Um, so you really can't tell. So the numbers that we had true numbers that we would actually report for ourselves. You know, we had this many men killed, this many men wounded, but the Viet Cong, they did not. Which is, which is the way it probably should be. I mean, why should we tell our enemy how successful or unsuccessful they were? Was that the time period where we called the enemy Charlie? Yes. And what was the significance of that? Or, or um, the reason? You know, I'm not really sure why we called them. Charlie, yeah. um, <laughs> I really don't know. Kong, C, I don't know. Maybe I'm not really so, sure. Yeah. What was the Roman number two? Was that the particular to the battle or the city? That that was the second battle. Second battle. It was the awful. first battle. There was six men killed okay. and sixteen men wounded, and that was just two days prior to this one. This one mm-hmm. was a huge, and the, the first one probably was just a total fluke. Mm-hmm. Uh, they weren't really ambushed. They there was probably. Um, our men came upon their men, and it was a battle. Yeah. This one was, they were ready for us, and they were waiting for us, and they were waiting for the right moment once we got there to attack us. Or, in fact, when they, they started their attack, uh, men had already got into this location, didn't know what they were supposed to be doing yet because no one had really given instructions. Okay, you go, you go over here and start digging a hole there. Yes, where your um, bunker is going to be. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, people were reading mail that they had received uh, maybe the day before, reading it a second time to make sure they didn't miss anything in it. And people were eating. People were taking their boots off. To, it was a beautiful area. That was the other thing. We were coming from a swamp. We came into this beautiful, mm-hmm. green, lush field that was high up. Men were... Uh, and, and that's the first thing I thought when I got there. I thought, man, this is great compared to where we just come from. I hated where we had been. Right. And so, and so people were sort of lax, and we thought we'd be attacked going through the jungle, but excuse me, we'd walk through the jungle, but it didn't happen. So you sort of, oh, oh great, they didn't attack us. Okay, so we're good. Now we're going to set up our camp here with a bunch of us, about 450 of us. They'll never dare do it here, but they did. Mm-hmm. You know, they they had us surrounded. They were in the jungle. We were in the clearing. Yeah. So it was more like a big. Shoot, the turkey kill, shoot. Yeah, the kill you know? zone. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell the listeners where they can find your book. Well, they can find it on Amazon, Barnes Noble, Books a Million, um, whatever else. Yeah, um, everywhere books are online. And yeah. we're going to do a, a second episode with the book Nook in. So, Stacy, do you want to tell us a little preview about the – that it's, yeah. a, it's a lesser-known place. Well, the book Nook in Bed and Breakfast has been open about seven years now, and we have five rooms that we do for our bed and breakfast. We also are a wedding venue, event <laughs> venue, and we stay very busy. So Yeah, it's in Lumberton. It's kind of in between Lumberton yeah. and Beaumont. Yes. Off the beaten path, definitely. I've yep. uh, been out there for one of the author awards. and it. Yeah. it oh, you were? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was okay. last year's. It the was pen the Pencraft pen pen craft Awards, award. yeah. Was it a year ago this week? It was a year ago. Um, 
Yeah, it was, the it was a year ago this mm-hmm. week. Um, yeah, and that's getting ready to come up. We're going to do that in January this year. I don't know that we're going to have it at the end just because we have so many people that right. want to come yeah. to it. And that It was a full house last year. Yeah, and that's something else we do. We review books. Um, the whole name of the book Nook Young came came about from our love for books and David's writing abilities of the books he's written. And so we review books. We have a book review website. And so that's kind of where the Pencraft Awards came from. Yeah. And so, yeah. And yeah, this is our fourth year. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, oh, yeah. Fourth yeah, year. Fourth yeah. Year. <gasps> and I'm telling you, when you're out there, you don't feel like you're in Lumberton. Right. You feel like you've yeah. escaped. We get that all the time. <laughs> gone to the hill country or something. Yeah. Yeah, we had German German people there last night. Yeah. Wow. People from all yeah. over the world. People from all over the and world. What are some of the events that people want to host out there? Mostly weddings at mm-hmm. this point. Um, we do smaller, intimate weddings, kind of for 100 people. That's about all we can seat. Um, right. We get lots of showers and birthday parties, and people are dying to do a murder mystery out there so oh, yeah. <laughs> we want to do that this next year so yeah because it, it's far enough out to where you're in the the country a little bit and it's right. darker i was there in the evening so right. you know it's got that the darker sky you can see yeah. this actually see the stars a little bit uh, yeah. i need to get out there during the daytime one day but i've seen Absolutely. the pictures online it's very impressive yeah. so we'll try to do an on location podcast out there awesome. showcase the facility a little bit awesome that'd be great all right. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, welcome Thank back you. anytime. It's a, a very impressive book, and I hope the I think the listeners are are gonna uh, really jump on that and learn some more history about Battle of Zombo. Yeah. Great. Thank Great. you. Great. Well, thank you for having us. All right. See everybody next time. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs>